Father, we just thank you, God, for a great day that you give us. And Father, I just thank you with all of my heart. I thank you for raising your son from the dead to prove that we can have life eternal with you, that the grave cannot hold us and neither can death as long as we have your son in our life and be the true Christian that we claim to be. Living with inside of us, God, and walking, and just like his word says, take up our cross each and every day and following him. And we praise you for that, God, and I thank you so much. And I pray this day, Father, that you'll be in our church today, be in our midst, let your spirit move in this place. Touch each and every one of our hearts and our ears and our eyes and open up our spiritual understanding and our spiritual eyes that we can see and hear your word and know what your word means and we praise you for your word and we thank you and again just hide me behind that precious cross God that your words are the only words that are spoken in the name of Jesus amen all right continuation of revelation chapter 3 again this will be another church and this is I guess there, there's two churches in there that uh, God didn't really throw any bad messages on, and this was one of them. Smart was the other one. But this is in Revelation 3. This is the church of Philadelphia. It's starting in verse 7. It says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts, and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and not and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those in the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet. And to you... And to know that I have loved you, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now again, this is Philadelphia, one of the seven churches that we've been talking about. Let me just give you a little background on this, on this place. It said that it's somewhere around 27 miles from Sardis and about 48 miles from Laodicea, which we'll be talking about next week. So it's kind of in the middle. It also says that it's, it is named Philadelphia means brotherly love is what it means. It's, let me just read this. It, its name was given to it in honor of At Attalus II because of his loyalty to his elder brother, Euminus, I believe is pronounced the second of Pergamon. So, in other words, just a, this guy had a brother, and he loved him so much it is said that he named this place after his brother, which it was called Philadelphios, I believe it was called at one time. But going on, it says still there another name of the city was Decapolis, because it was considered one of the ten cities of the plain. So in this place that it's in, it's in a, in a region that's kind of a flat place, a plain, like it says. And it also says it sometimes bore the title of Little Athens because of the magnificence of the temples and the other public buildings which adorned it. And it said that it had so many gods in this place and so many temples that sometimes men actually called this place Little Athens. So again, just like the other cities, it had many gods. It also says it's the center of worship of the Olympian gods. 
Now, what this is, the Olympian gods, you know, you know where the where the Olympics come from. It comes from Greece, which which the Olympians. Okay, just to give you an example, when the you know it all started, basically the runners. You remember the runners and the TV shows that be told in the torches and they'll be running. So what it was, they would have these tournaments, just like the Olympics that we have now. Now, granted, it wasn't the throwing the spears and jumping and type type of stuff. A lot of it was running and fighting and different things. But anyway, anyway, one of the most popular ones was the runners that would hold the torches. And and granted, the 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 main thing was, you know, sure the runner, the first one, it's always known as the first one to get there would win. Would not necessarily with these Greek runners. Okay? The Greek runner that ran and got to the finish line with his torch still lit one okay it wasn't just because you run across the finish line meant you won if you run across the finish line and your torch was still lit in the greek olympics okay but anyway the the olympics they had was was based and not based but uh was for the olympic gods okay the olympian gods that's that's what they had there that's one of the one of the big things it also says that uh Philadelphia quickly became an important and wealthy trade center for as the coast cities declined, it grew in power. So see, cities on the coastline, you know, like it just said, they kind of declined, so the inner cities began to grow. And one of the things about Philadelphia said that they had, you know, volcanoes around there, and there was so much volcanic ash that would fall on the plains of this place made it real fertile. Okay, so they were able to grow big crops and things such as that. It also says that, like the other cities in Asia Minor, it often often had to be rebuilt due to earthquakes. It's well known in this particular region for massive earthquakes, and it would it is said if you go and look it up and, and study a little of the history of it, it was said that an earthquake would come and it would just basically destroy much of the city. Then somebody would come along and rebuild it. Okay, so that's that's just a little background. It even says that Roman emperors often helped rebuild these cities because, you know, Roman emperors, they had power, they had money, and they wanted to control and have control over a lot of these cities and the wealth of it, so they would help rebuild it. And Philadelphia was one of these places. And like I said, you got to remember, they had a lot of these other gods there and and, and just a lot of pagan worship and, and things going on. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. So as it goes on in verse 7, we just read, it says, These things says, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one, sh- no one shuts and shuts and no one's open. But see where it says, He who is holy. And notice it does not say and. Now this is New King James, okay? It says, He who is holy and he who is true. This word holy, you remember we talked about it time and time again, about being being separate, someone who is different, someone who does not go along with the world or the thinking of the world. It just goes, you know, it, it's separate. It, it means separate, but it also means this. In this particular sense, in Revelation, if you go and look it up, it, it also means sacred, okay, which also goes along and says sacred, physically Pure, morally, blameless, or religious, ceremonially, and consecrated. So see, all of these different things is talking about Jesus. He who is holy. And even remember, whenever we was reading in Isaiah that time, in Isaiah 6, where it's talking about what the <clears throat> what those angels were saying, you know, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You know, and also even in Revelation 4 and 8, it says the four living creatures, each having six wings, and we read this before, full of eyes around and within, And they did not rest day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. See, Jesus is holy. He says, He who is holy. And also says, He who is true. You know, the first thing you think about when somebody is true, you say, you know, I'll tell the truth. That means, you know, basically they're not lying. You know, and you hope they're not lying when they say they're telling the truth, especially in this day and time. You know, it's really sad because, of, you know, you just you, you just about can't believe anybody anything says. And I've, I've said this before. You know, if you want somebody not to believe you, just tell them the truth. They just about won't believe you. 
It's really sad, but it's the truth, and you, <laughs> you know that. But anyway, true. What is, what's the word true? said, he who is true. This is what it says. It means the opposite to what is imperfect, defective, frail, and even uncertain. The opposite of those things. It also says that which, and I like this, listen, that which has not only the name and resemblance, but the real nature corresponding to the name. So when you think about Jesus, you blink, you, you really, me, I think of pureness, you know, pure, holy, and someone that's not going to lie to you, someone that's going to be there when they say they're going to be there. It also means this, in every respect corresponding to the idea signified by the name. It also means real, true, genuine. So it kind of gives you a little bit of an idea, you know. And, and, you know, if you really stop and think about it in a spiritual aspect, there's really, to, to me, there's really no way to truly express what these words truly mean, especially when it comes to the divine part of Jesus. You know, you really think about it, because if we think about truth, first thing we think about, you know, is, is someone, somebody lying. Somebody holy, first thing we think about, you know, well, they make mistakes. So that just totally knocks them out of that classification. But it says, these things says... He who is holy. He who is true. True. Revelation 6 and 10, it says, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? See, that's in, in Revelation. How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Revelation 3 and 14. And this is in, in the next church. It says, And to the angel of the church of Laodicean, write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Talking about Jesus again, said the beginning of the creation of God. Revelation 19 and 11 says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. See, I mean, you, you even, to me, it's really even hard to fathom somebody being that pure and that holy and that truthful. You know, especially in the world that we live in today, especially, especially someone who is trying to send a message to a church, you know, because it's so many people just, <laughs> I don't know, let me just move on. Then it goes on, says, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens the key of david what this is it's, it's kind of like this is the key of david was it was kind of like the prophecy being fulfilled you know jesus having the key of david it, it's like the prophecy being fulfilled of of not only that but if you go and tie in everything in revelation of where jesus has the key of david the prophecies being fulfilled of all the authority of the new Jerusalem coming down, which was the heavenly city, you know, coming to this place. And another example, in Isaiah twenty two twenty two, it says, The key of the house of David I will lay on his shoulders. He shall open, and no one shall shut. And he shall shut, and no one shall open. You know, we all think of these things, and every one of us has used this example many times of how many, you know, we'll, we'll tell somebody, you know, well, God will open this door and close this one and close this one and open this one. And, and yes, he does to, to a degree. I guess he does. You know, that's, that's a good example. You know, he wants people to, to move in different directions or say different things or, 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 you know, take on another job or whatever the case may be. You know, it, it's... And he does. He does these things. But he says that when he opens one, nobody can shut it. And when he closes one, nobody can open it back up. I mean, that's really even hard to conceive. You know, if Jesus does it, then there's no changing it. There, there's no making, no any alterations or anything like that. Matthew 16 and 19 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Yes, he's talking to the disciples. He says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. You see, that's kind of the similarity. It's kind of the same thing. So he's giving them authority to do something. So 
So whatever they bind will be bound, and nothing can unbind it. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And I hope you see in that picture. See, Jesus had that authority. God gave him the authority to shut things down, open things up, close things, and nobody can change it. And even Jesus said that, told the disciples that, hey, they have the same thing. I, I'll give you the keys. I'll give you some of these keys. You're not going to get them all. Basically, that's what, that's what happened. You're not going to get them all. And you'll see some of this in the next verse, verse 8. He says, I know your works. Again, see, he, he knows. He already knows what they're doing. He already knows every one of these churches. You know, I know your works. I know what you're doing. Just like in this church. Jesus knows what we're doing. God already knows what's happening. He already knows what's here, what's going on. You know, just like everything else, he knows our thoughts and all this type of stuff. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. Now, see, he set before them an open door. Acts 14 and 27 says this. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them. And he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So see, what was this open door? He says, I opened a door to you. One thing right off the bat, we have to understand that the church in Philadelphia was a faithful church. You notice right off, the, right off the start, he never complained about them. He never said, hey, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, like all the other churches. He didn't do that. He started out with a great basic blessing, more or less. He says, I've opened up a door. So with all of these people being faithful as they were, it made me think, maybe this door that they opened up or God opened up for them in this place that they live in was some great opportunity to go out and share the gospel. Share the gospel because of their faith, because of their strength, as you're going to see in a minute. Their strength and all of this that they could go out and <clears throat> share the gospel with people. I've, I've opened a door for you because you're faithful and true. It says that, he had, that you have little strength. Now, what is this little strength? You know, first thing many people many people would think about is, you know, they're a good Christian, they, they know the Lord, they, they can go out and, and they can do things, and yes. But you notice he says you have a little strength. So God had blessed them with some, some let me see if I can explain this. You know, if you really stop and think about it, a true church that truly loves the Lord and really pursues God and want to do what they say, they, they kind of have some power. Strength means power, basically. If you go and look it up, it basically means power. So if you, if you got power, and I don't mean power to the point to where you can go and, and, and curse someone and cast all this, you know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the power of God working within you. And that's what they have. So if you've got the power of God working within you, and just like, let me just use this for an example. You know, I've said many times, if you want somebody to shut up, go to talking about Jesus and they'll leave you alone, and they'll probably walk away. It happens many times to me. And it's not that I use it against anybody, but if you want to stop someone from talking ugly or sharing nasty stuff, go to talking about the Lord, and they'll be quiet. That's power. That, that's the power that God puts inside of us, that is Christians. So they have strength inside of this pagan city, inside of this place that has all of these pagan temples, just like we talked about the Olympian gods and all of these other gods that were there, these pagan temples that they built, God had placed with inside of them power and strength that they could go out and do this without being persecuted, punished, or anything like that because they had the power of God inside of them. And, I, and <clears throat> maybe they knew this verse, Philippians 4 and 13, says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And so many people take that one little verse and throw it so much out of context. And I'll tell you. Notice what it says. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Strengthens me. Because he gives us strength if we'll just take it and use it. I can do, I can, I can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
Not that I can go out and, and be a brain surgeon. I can't walk out of here and do that. So, well, Christ gives me the strength to do this. No, he, not, no. I can't do that. But I can go out and I can be a Christian. I can go out and be the, be, be the Christian that God has made me to be. I can go out and share the gospel the way that he wants it shared. I can go out and tell people about Jesus. That type of strength. That type of strength which is power. And I'm not talking about power going out to pick up a building or nothing. I'm, not, I'm just talking about the power of God. So see, these people had strength. They had power. They had this because of what God was doing through them. And it goes on and it says, You little... <coughs> You have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So see, I mean, he's just steady building them up with a blessing. You're, you're doing what is right. Can you imagine a church? Just try to picture in your mind just for a minute. Imagine a church that Jesus would say, y'all got it going on. Or would he go in a church today and say, I got this against you, I got this against you, you're doing this wrong. But could you imagine Jesus walking up into your church and saying, y'all got it going on, man. You got it right. You're doing it right. And basically that's what he's saying. Have kept my word and not denied my name. <clears throat> How many churches, and really think about this, how many churches that you know of, and you don't have to name or anybody or talk about or anything, but can you, can you, do you know any places that really don't keep God's word, but they call themselves churches? How many people that, have you seen it, <clears throat> where it says, and have not denied my name, how many people, and I, I'm, I'm not scared to say it and you know it, plaster all over Facebook that they're a Christian. You know, religious basis or whatever it is on there. I ain't been on there in so many years, I don't even know what it's under now. But it, it, it just says, you know, Christian, 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 Christian. And when you see them on the street, they would no more talk about Jesus or God or anybody to save their life. Friends, that's denying his name because they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to do it. They don't want to keep his word. They don't. And it says, it has not denied my name, but yet that's denying it. When people walk away and don't want to do it, that's denying. That's turning their back on him. It is. That's, that's what it is. Let me, let me just, in John 14, it says this. John 14 and 21. It says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, Listen to what Jesus, this is Jesus now. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. Then there's a period. That's what it says. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. If you'll notice so many times whenever in the, in the New Testament, it has amazed me in the past few years of the things that I have read of how much in there Jesus emphasizes loving him and God. Loving him. Think about it. Time and time and time again in the scriptures where Jesus talks about over and over and over loving him and God. Because if you love someone with all of your being, you're going to do everything within your own personal power to please them. I don't care who they are. Spouse, friend, whatever the case may be. Especially God. And especially Jesus. But the verse goes on. It says, And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. So if you love Jesus, and I don't mean saying, Yes, I love Jesus. Or sing that song, Oh, how I love Jesus. I mean love him. Love him to the point, like I've said time and time again, when you see an image of him with his body ripped all to pieces on the cross, or even you picture it within your mind, that it breaks your heart to where it hurts, to the point to where 
the Holy Spirit begins convicting you of things that you possibly do wrong. That maybe needs to be changed. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. You see that? It says if we love him and his Father loves you, I will love him. See, Jesus will love us. And guess what? Not only that, but he will manifest himself to us. That means say, I'm home. Here I am. Talk, commune, show, convict, lead, guide, direct, speak, and show himself to the point to where when you look out into the world, you can see him. You can see him at work. You can just, you know he's there. Verse 22 of this same chapter, it says, Judas, which not the Judas Iscariot, <clears throat> said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? So see, that's two different bunches now. That's two different groups. You got the group that love him, that he will manifest himself to, then you got the world. That don't give a flip one way or the other if Jesus is coming now. I'm serious, guys, and y'all know what I'm talking about. How is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, so see, this is Jesus talking again. If look, here, here we go again. If anyone loves me, there's that word again, if anyone loves me, love him, love him, love him. If you don't love him, fall in love with him. If you don't know how to fall in love with him, ask him to teach you how to fall in love with him. Show me, Jesus, how do I fall in love with you? If anyone loves me, that's what it says. If anyone loves me, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. He will keep my word. What is his word? The words that he spoke. Have you ever went through your Bible? My, mine's red letter. I mean, I'll show you. You can see the red in it. Red letter. Okay, red letter is what Jesus. Hey, I, I tell you another song. Go and find oh, that Crowder bunch that sings and find that song, Red Letter. That joke will knock you out. <laughs> it, go, I'm serious. Go look it up on YouTube. It's by the Crowders. I don't know who that, how, how you spoke it. It's called Red Letter. First time I heard it, guys, I, I literally had tears coming down my eyes. It's beautiful, beautiful. Anyway, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, my word. And I'm saying this because of this. Have you ever went and read just the words of Jesus? Just the words. I'm, I'm serious. Skip over the black part and just go to the red. And read what Jesus spoke and just see how many times he talks about loving him and God. And his word, his commands, the things that he says. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. See, he says it again. Not only loving Jesus, but keeping his word, then my father will love him. And listen, and we will come to him. Check that one out. Not just Jesus, but both of them. It says, we will come to him and make our home with him. Make our home with him. Just by loving him. Loving Jesus. Loving the Father. Keeping his word. And then it goes on. In verse 24, since, and it says this. He who does not love me does not keep my words. See? All of these great blessings, just in this little bit of verses right here that Jesus speaks, then he turns around, and it, it, it's so sad. I could, I could just imagine him sitting in a group of people. In a group of people. You know, the disciples sitting around, maybe they're just talking to them. or I'm, I'm sure that, you know, probably other people might just be kind of lingering around. You know, I don't know. I wasn't there. But I can only just picture. He's talking to the disciples and possibly some people maybe kind of lingering around a little bit and they listen to him. And then all of a sudden they, they, they hear all these great things that Jesus is going to do. He'll manifest himself. He'll show himself. 
Just keep my word. If you love me, just love me. If you love me, my God will love you. We'll come and live with you. You know, all these different things. And all of a sudden he says, He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the words which you hear is not of mine, but of the Father who sent me. Jesus was telling people what God was telling him. He was. He was telling the people what God was telling him. Love them. And can, can you picture this church in Philadelphia? It says, I know your works. I, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. You know, I could, I could just, when I read that, I could just picture someone sharing this that Jesus said with possibly these people. And it was just, it was so encouraging. It was, you know, they, they didn't, they hadn't denied them. Of all the churches, of all the child, of all seven churches, only two, only two, one was being persecuted, unreal. And this one was just living in a city with so much paganism and all these different things. For example, verse 9, it says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, they will, I, will, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. See, going right back to those verses I just read. You know, just like the church in Smyrna that we just spoke about a minute ago, Revelations 2 and 9, Jesus says, I know your works. Tribulation and poverty, all the things that these people were going through, says, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. See, even over in Smyrna, he called them the synagogue of Satan. And what this was, guys, and I, I said it then, it, it, it was the Jewish people. You still had the Jewish people around that was hanging on and, and being really hard on, on all those different laws. And I'll throw this in there. It wasn't so much the laws of Moses, okay? It was a bunch of the man-made laws that the scribes, Pharisees, and all those people have made up. If you go back again over into, in, into where Jesus was talking, what did he call them? He called them many times. The, the, you are of your father Satan. You know, he called them that. He told them one time about the rituals that they do that man has made. And that's what he's talking about here. These people, they're, they're coming in. They're not listening. They're not wanting to worship. They're not wanting to listen because these people were tormenting this church just like the church at Smyrna where it says their poverty, where the people would come in, they would take their goods, their food, and all this type of stuff. And these people weren't so much going through the same thing, but what they were doing, they were holding their ground. They were taking a stand for Jesus. And these people, this, this, this Jewish bunch of people were just probably ridiculing. They were driving them in the ground. They, weren't, they were trying to probably stop the church. And just like many others, you know, they were probably trying to get into the church. And these people were taking a stand. You're not coming in. You're not a Christian. You don't love Jesus. And you're not bringing your garbage up in our church. That's just hypothetical. I don't know that to be an exact, but I can only picture in my mind what these people were doing to these, this church. But Jesus is saying, you're hanging on. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're not letting, allowing all of this thing. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to prove to them that I love you. That's what I'm going to do. So see, he even says, indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I loved you. And it's not so much that the people were going to come in and worship these people. That's not the point. They were going to come in and they were going to know that Jesus was real. He's alive and he's a whale and he's going to do what he's going to say he's going to do and they're going to turn. The Bible plainly says that every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everybody. That's what the Bible says. And that to me, this is a prime example of that because Jesus is going to say, these are the ones that love me. These are the ones that trust me. These are the ones who want to know who I am. 
And you can only picture possibly the day that that happened or the day that will happen because this is revelation that these people will bow and they're going to see it. Maybe not that day, but one day. Isaiah 49 and 23, it says this. Kings shall be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to, your, to you with their faces to the earth and lick up the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. You see it? All the way back in the Old Testament. Let me read it again. The kings shall be your foster fathers. Their queens shall be your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth and lick up the dust of your feet, then you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. The ones who want him. The ones who love him. Just like this church, striving so hard. Verse 10, it says, Because you have kept my command to preserve, I will also keep you, from the hour of trial. Now notice right there, it's kind of self-explanatory, the first part of that. Because you have kept my command to pers persevere. I'm sorry. So in other words, they're keeping their command to keep going. We kind of kind of basically touched on that a little bit. They're not giving up. They're, 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 going, they're going to keep kicking. They're going to keep fighting to the bitter end. So he's saying, you have kept my command to, to persevere. And it turns around and says, I will also keep you. Now this word keep. Notice what it says. It's, I, will, I also will keep you from the hour. This word keep means to attend to carefully. He's going to attend to them. He's going to take care of them. It also means take care of. It also means to guard. So see, everything they're going through, he's going to guard, and he's going to take care of them, and he's going to see to them. He's not going to let them fall. He's not going to let them fumble the ball or anything like that. He's going to take care of them. That's what he means. And he was going to keep them. Hebrews 13 and 5, it says, and listen, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But there's one little section in there. One little section in there so many people kind of skip over. It says, Be content with such things as you have. So in other words, it, you know, he, he told these folks that you got a little strength. He didn't tell them that they were kings and priests and powerful and all this type of stuff. He says you got a little strength. You're, you're hanging on. You kept my commandments. You're persevering. So this particular verse tells us, to me, okay, to me, this is where you're at. So you need to be content. Be happy because I'm right there with you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. But be content with what you have. You know, so every one of us know that God gives us things. He's going to take care of us. The Bible plainly says it. And I believe this church has come to that understanding that we're going to be happy right here with the Lord. And it goes on. It says, I will keep you also from the hour of trial which has come upon the whole world to test you. So the trial which shall come upon the whole world and test those who dwell on the earth. Now, you see, <clears throat> notice it says, the trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So see, there's a section there where it says he's going to test them. Maybe us. All the way back in Daniel. <clears throat> all the way back in Daniel, in chapter 12 and verse 1, it says this. At that time, Michael shall stand up, okay, Michael, the archangel. Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble. Now, this is prophecy. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there, let me, let me back up, such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, and at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. But see, it says that there shall be a time of trouble. At that time, 
your people shall be delivered. So see, that's a prophecy of all the way down. It says everyone who is found in the book, written in the book. So see, the whole world's going to be tested. And he's telling them this. You know, you're going to be tested. This could be a time of testing that they're going through. You know, we don't know exactly, but that it's a time. Then it goes into verse 11. It says, Behold, I, will, I, come, I am coming quickly. It says, Hold fast what you have, and not, no one may take your crown. Now, this word quickly, okay? This word quickly means sudden and unexpected. That's what the word quickly means. It does not necessarily mean right now, okay? It don't necessarily mean right now. In some instances, yes. But, Again, right now, this was wrote in when? 97 A.D. So he's telling them, you know, I come quickly, sudden, and un even unexpectedly. And like I said, it does not necessarily mean right now. Okay? It can, but, you know. Anyway, Revelations 3 and 3 says, Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast, just like he told them right here. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you do not if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. And see, it's telling them to hold fast. And I think that's a lot of the trouble with the churches today that I can see. People don't want to hang on. They don't want to hold on to the better end. Because so much of the world, and even the churches today, they, they live for now. Right now. You know, we, they, they run into their churches and, and, and they, they, they sing their songs and, and all these different things. And when they walk out, it's, there's no change. It's like you just went and paid your dues. You know, okay, God, I came and done what I'm supposed to do, so I'll see you next Sunday. But these people, to me, they live their life that they lived in the church outside the church and I think that's what Jesus one of the great things that he gave to these people he, he recognized what they were doing they weren't living two lives like most of the world they lived the life in, outside the church that they lived inside the church they loved God outside the church and they loved him inside the church and so, but, he's, but he's, giving them, he's giving them a little something says hold fast to what you have in other words he's saying you're doing it right you got it going on, so hang on. may not be long, but I'll be back. Hang on. Hold fast to what you have. Then he turns around and says, no one may take your crown. So in other words, they've earned a crown. Okay? He says, no one may take your crown. Now let me just read this. There's a, <clears throat> in the Blue Letter Bible, okay, you can go to commentaries in there, and you can find a guy by the name of David, I think it's pronounced Guzik. G-U-Z-I-K, Guzik, I think that's where you pronounce it. He's a commentary writer, okay? Then this is what he wrote about this particular phrase, no one can take your crown. And he says, never forget, and I want you to listen, never forget that the man, never forget that the man most likely to steal your crown is yourself, Never forget that the man most likely to steal your crown is yourself. You know, I can't come and, and take something from you that God has given you. I can't come and take your faith away. I can't come and take your salvation away. I can't come and do anything to you in the Spirit. But you can walk away. Like I've shared before, time before. We're the one. Proverbs 4, 4 and 23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence. Keep your heart, keep your heart with all diligence. It's called you can't keep mine. You have to keep your own, each and every one of us. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. It's from the heart. There's a gentleman by the name, he's he's a he's a he's an evangelist, he's done passed on. I mean, he's he was back in the early nineteen hundreds. His name was Vance Hanver. He wrote this. Says you are in no greater danger from anyone or anything than from yourself. Think about it. I thought it was a great thing he said. Verse 12, 
Moving on. It says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. See, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my father, my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name, that pillar. The word pillar here means support, picture of strength, stability, dignified beauty, but also if you stop and think about it, whenever I mention about Philadelphia in the beginning, they had massive earthquakes. And some commentators and some people believe that one reason Jesus put this word pillar in there is because of the fact of all the earthquakes. That I will make you a pillar, strong, stable. And not only that, but there's another guy. <clears throat> there's another guy by the name of William Barley, Barclay. He was another evangelist. He, he's done passed on also. And he said this, due to the fact of, of, of the things that he knew about this. He said, Philadelphia, remember, Philadelphia was named after this gentleman's brother. Okay? So he was a king or a ruler over this place. It says, Philadelphia, which is this particular guy, what he's talking about, honored its illustrious sons. This guy honored its illustrious sons by putting their names on the pillars of its temples so that all who came to worship might see and remember. I thought that was really, went right along with it. So good. You know, Jesus making these people a pillar, a column, so that when you go through the entrance, you would see them. Just pictured. I mean, in the heavenly part. I mean, so great. And it says... He shall go out no more. He's going to be a pillar. It says he shall go out no more. And when you think about this, <clears throat> you can picture these people. You know, they become a pillar. They're up in glory. And can you imagine having these people having to go through all the earthquakes, listening to all these Jews, being just verbally tormented, and all this type of stuff, and and, and possibly, you know, people that, and not only that, but I, I can't remember the guy's name that, that I mentioned that was killed in, in one of the other churches for, you know, being he was martyred. And it's said that so many people were still being martyred in all these different places. But these people up there, they become a pillar, and it says he shall not go out no more. They don't have to go and see this anymore. They don't have to be tormented anymore. They don't have to listen to this stuff anymore. They don't have to be involved in these earthquakes, probably family members dying, and all these different things. He said, you're going to be a pillar. You don't have to go out anymore. And then he turns around and says, I will write on him the name of my God. You remember one time I think we went through many of the names of God. El Shaddai, Elohim, all of those different things. Write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. Friends, these people were going to be honored. These people were going to be recognized up there in glory. They were going to see these things. And it even turns around and says, I will write on him my new name. These, this was a church. This was a people that loved God. These were people that wanted to serve him. These were people that truly wanted to be the church that God could say, well done. You're doing it right. And this is what they did. William Barclay even said one more time. He said, The tragedy of life and of the world is not that men do not know God. The tragedy of life of the world is not that men do not know God. The tragedy is that knowing Him, they still insist on going their own way. You ask anybody in the United States of America if they know God, everybody will answer, yeah, pretty much. I, 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 I mean, just I don't know the percentage, but I, I would be willing to say that at least 90% of the people in America, yeah, I know him. But what did he say? They still insist on going their own way. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Can you imagine being part of a church that God sent a letter to like that? 
it just it's, it's just my mind can't even wrap around it but could you imagine but one key thing I want to point out and I'm going to say it friends if you haven't learned to love Jesus ask him to help you fall in love with him fall in love